In a matter of weeks, companies including Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, and so many more have showered nearly $1.2 million on D.C. politicians. They are all lobbying against the PRO Act. That legislation, of course, would give independent workers the right to unionize. Ryan Grimm is noting in the Intercept's Deconstructed podcast, firms, trade associations, FedEx, Boeing, Aflac, they're spending $70 million lobbying Congress with a similar agenda. So D.C. Bureau Chief of the Intercept, host of the pod- Deconstructed podcast, Ryan Grimm, joins us now to discuss. Ryan, tell us just Break down the lobbying campaign that we're seeing right now in Washington. Right, as you mentioned, the gig companies are kind of the the Mm -hmm. tip of the spear here, and they're and they're and they're fighting awfully hard. But the entire uh, corporate sector of America is involved in this fight. If you go through the lobbying filings, as Zach and Rose did for the Intercept, and you know, found in the first just three months of this year, over seventy million dollars in in spending. And if you look at the if you look at the spending on the the pro pro act side, organized labor mostly, less than ten million dollars. American Federation of Labor (AFL CIO) about a million and a half, you know, over over that stretch of time. So the 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 imbalance is stark, but it's also interesting going through the filings, seeing who is lobbying because behind every dollar that somebody's spending in Washington to maintain the status quo is an exploited worker somewhere that they're trying to uh, continue to exploit. They do not want the rules to change around what workers are, are entitled to as, em- as employees or how they can become employees and what rights they have to collectively bargain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just so people know, the PRO Act has a wide range of policies within it. It's basically everything the labor movement's been pushing for over the past number of years put together in one piece of legislation. But part of what's getting the most pushback is it would make independent gig workers, it would make it easier for them to organize. It would change the way. So for example, right now, if you are at one McDonald's franchise, you can't band together with other McDonald's workers to unionize. And that's another important way that they've kept unions out of the fast food industry. So it would change some of the laws around that. Uh, Experts estimate that it could double the number of workers who are unionized in the private sector, which would, of course, be incredibly significant here. I mean, Ryan, I always look at this, these numbers and like the vociferous nature of the pushback, and I'm almost a little amused by it because it seems unlikely to me at this point that the PRO Act has much of a path to passage, but they're very much taking it seriously like it does have a path to passage, which I guess in a weird way sort of gives me a little bit of hope. Right. If it had zero path to passage, you you wouldn't have these companies, you know, who who oppose it spending 70 plus million dollars just in a mm-hmm. in a couple of months lobbying against it. And and what it really reveals is is the fundamental transformation that we've seen in our economy over over the last say 30 or 40 years. If it, you you look at the the random industries that are lobbying on this, you can just p- pick them out. Take a look at the insurance industry. You're like, well, why is Aflac spending so much money lobbying against the PRO Act? You know, you don't, you don't, you don't think of the insurance industry as connected to labor issues in this way. But then you peel it back a little bit later. You talk to anybody who's actually been an insurance agent, and their their business model relies on on classifying people as independent contractors so that they don't pay them a salary, they don't pay them benefits, they don't they don't have to basically pay them. Period. You know, a, a lot of in, insurance agents they have to pay for the phone, they have to rent the, the, the rent the cubicle, any brochures that they're handing out to customers they have to they have to pay for those, and then they watch these videos about how you know if you do everything right you'll be making six figures within a year or two, and maybe a, a handful of agents do make that, but along the way, lots of other agents actually end up in debt having having gone to work. Uh, a lot of the others barely, barely, barely scrape by. And that's only a- allowed because of the way that these companies are able to game the current classification system. And so they, they want that to continue. They don't want to have to treat people as actual employees because their business model re- relies on just churning through endless numbers of people. If you ever know anybody who's working in that insurance industry, they'll probably tell you, oh, yes. Uh, you know, th- there were all of these promises that were made at the at the front end, and then at the back end, it, it turned out that it was mostly just fool's gold. So, Glenn, uh, sorry, sorry, we just had Glenn on. The- <laughs> sorry about that. Ryan, um, tell us about the legislative prospects of the PRO Act, because how are they going to get around the filibuster? Just how would that even work? 
So one of the big wins, and we, and we talk about that this in the last episode of Deconstructed, is, is that it, it, it got attached to the American Jobs Plan, which is, go, which is going through under reconciliation. And so there, there are a significant, there's a significant amount of it that experts feel like can go through on a 50 vote threshold because it, it does impact the budget. What they're doing is they're, they're basically turning the dial on, on fines and they're allowing the NLRB to actually fine people. You know, companies right now, when they, when they engage in unfair labor practices, have very, very little risk of facing any meaningful consequences. And so what, what this does is it says, oh, you, you know, you unfair labor practice, all right, that's $10,000 a day per violation. Uh, you know, that and that starts to add up and that starts to get the attention of people. It also is the kind of thing that a parliamentarian could say, OK, well, that's actually revenue for the government. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're changing the you're changing the policy in order to uh, attract that revenue. So, OK, that that qualifies under reconciliation. There's a lot that wouldn't. And so and for that, they would have to uh, they would have to reform the, the filibuster. They right now have uh, 47 votes, though. So, so they're three votes short. And those those three are uh, Mark Warner of Virginia and the two Arizona senators, uh, Mark Kelly and Kirsten Sinema. Uh, un- unlike in 2009 with EFCA card check under Obama, none of those senators are, act- are publicly opposed yet. Uh, labor was crushed right out of the gate under Obama with a bunch of senators coming out. So, you know what, we're not doing card check. And they, they were just flat on their back and they and they never recovered from it. So. At, at least they're at least they're still fighting for those votes. And even if they, those three don't co-sponsor, labor is confident that if that if it gets put on the floor, that they're not going to hold up the American Jobs Act and Biden's agenda in order to stop uh, the PRO Act, even though it would most likely be watered down, particularly around uh, gig companies in order to get yeah. them on board. Yeah, well, I guess that's a big question is what right. is the parliamentarian going to rule on all of these different pieces? <laughs> yes. Ryan, thank you so we much. We weighed her wisdom and her yes. judgment. Her Why alchemy, whether she saw her. a shadow or... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan, thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Got it. More rising for you after this.